at your leisure. Then let's call to order. Let's uh, pledge allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Thank you, everyone. And um, just, uh, I want to just uh, thank you all for attending our holiday party today. And uh, it was um, definitely wonderful to see all of our employees there, the ones that I've never met. And um, we are now on to the business of the day. And I was just wondering, is there any comment from the public? Seeing none. Let us uh, get on right on to our, uh, our uh, matter at hand, and that is um, the Ocean Management Plan. Thank you. We have uh, a presentation Heather McElroy is going to make. Um, we were part of the Ocean Advisory Committee, which was created by the Ocean Management Act. Uh, Stacy Justice uh, was the staff member that was appointed that for the first six months or so, and then Stacy moved to Michigan. And Heather actually placed her on that uh, committee and I've attended a few of those uh, committees. So as we were moving through the process, the plan by legislative mandate has to issue by December 31st. So we have another couple of weeks before that issues. And there have been some intense negotiations um, concerning the details of that plan that uh, Senator Rob O'Leary has been involved with, along with the Cape Cod Commission and the Marcus Nickel but I think the best place to start would be from the beginning with a presentation by him. ago with uh, the Massachusetts Oceans Act 2008, signed in May of last year. Um, following the governor's signature on that act, the Executive Office of Environment, you know, Energy and Environmental Affairs, which for simplification I refer to as EEA, um, formed an Ocean Advisory Commission and several other commissions and work groups, including a, a Scientific Advisory Commission, um, to really facilitate the data gathering and public input on the plan. Um, and as Paul indicated, we had a staff person um, attending, a participant, an active participant in that Ocean Advisory Commission. That commission held public hearings through the fall and, and uh, winter of last year, um, including a couple of hearings here in Cape Cod to gather uh, public input. They had hearings across the state. <coughs> they then went away and quickly put together um, a plan, a draft plan, which they issued on June 30th of this year. Um, they invited public comment, their official um, comment period on that draft plan started um, with their first hearing in September, concluding on November 23rd when the comment period ended. Heather, yes. what does EEA stand for? Ex Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. So they, you know, they are the umbrella for all things. Okay, and it's their plan that they're promulgating? They are the ones promulgating the plan. Okay. Are they the ones that had the hearings? They are. Uh, the, the staff um, hosted some of the hearings with the Ocean Advisory Commission, which includes members of both RPAs, uh, legislators, um, various interested parties for nonprofits and interest groups. And this was initiated by Senator earlier in the beginning. The Oceans this, Act the, was. The Oceans Act, right. Yes. So this is the plan to follow that. Exactly. Um, and as we've discussed, the, the state is required to promulgate a final plan on December 31st. So um, the Act uh, establishes 15 ocean planning principles, which they refer to as the Ocean 15 
um, by which this plan was to be developed. It includes things like stewardship of the ocean, preserving the public trust, um, reflecting the recreational and economic benefits the ocean provides to us, and also acknowledging the, the value of maintaining the ecosystem health of our oceans. Um, the Act also calls for the plan to allow for appropriately scaled renewable energy development, which is a new use allowed in our ocean waters, going beyond the limited uses that the Ocean Sanctuaries Act um, established. Uh, the plan has to be implemented through the existing state review procedures, and it needs to be revised every five years. <coughs> plan development, briefly, um, I wasn't involved in it directly, but from what I understand, they went through a, an extensive data collection process. Um, they did spatial analysis, which is essentially mapping those, those uh, data that they collected. Um, they evaluated various different kinds of management options for implementing um, this plan, and they issued a draft plan in June. Uh, so a little overview of the kind of data that they collected. Um, they mapped numerous critical natural resources, including fish and birds, marine mammals, um, also the abiotic resources, the, those things on the ocean floor, within the ocean, that support all of the other uh, flora and fauna. Um, they also mapped existing ocean uses that are significant um, to us all. Commercial fishing activities, recreational fishing and boating. They also noted areas that were um, just sort of purely recreational by, by use. Um, they also mapped wind and tidal resources and they mapped historic resources. Then they went through a data analysis process, um, primarily using the science advisory group. Um, it broke down into work groups, but essentially to identify and map special, sensitive, and unique areas. These were specifically for um, the the natural resources that are out there. Um, identify these SSUs, special, sensitive, and unique habitats. So just to look at what some of this data looks like, just a couple of examples. Um, this is the commercial fisheries activity, and I've indicated very generally where the data came from. There's an extensive discussion in the plan about how they collect the data and where the data came from. Um, but this shows um, commercial fisheries activity by high medium low, high being the darker color, low being the lighter color. Uh, here's recreational fishing areas. You know, where does where are there concentrations of recreational fishing happening? Here wind and current speeds. Again, sort of high, medium, low. Um, and I should have said to begin with, what we're looking at, this red outline is the, uh, the planning area for the ocean management plan. So the state established roughly a um, 0.3 nautical mile from land, from mean high water out into the ocean as their starting point, and then to three miles from mean high water nautical miles from mean high water, um, which looks like this, it's this sort of buffer that comes around. And then in certain areas where the Commonwealth, the extent of the Commonwealth waters go beyond that three mile limit, then we have um, a greater area here, here obviously. Um, the planning area excludes certain harbor areas, um, you know, in the Boston Harbor here. Um, this is the whole area, basically Sandy Neck, the Barnstable Harbor area is excluded, for example. Why, excuse me, why is that? I think they, uh, I don't know the exact reason, but they, they decided that there were um, resources that were inside of that line that were within the jurisdiction of, of towns that were, you know, towns were actively managing those areas. Um, and that the areas that were more, more in the public domain were going to be the subject of okay. yeah, the one of the one of the issues that comes up immediately is that the, I believe that the town of Sandwich uh, is trying to get authority to uh, build. I guess it would be a groin as a result there because part of the problem there is erosion and also uh, a flow of um, and not hazardous material, but uh, particulate matter that is that is affecting the uh, 
that coast mm -hmm. when you put down San Miguel. Uh, Southern so, transport. Yeah. Right. Thank you. If they're doing that, uh, and that's not within the area of you know, planning, uh, what you know that that had seemed to me to be uh, you know, an appropriate issue because of the regional nature of it, because part of Sandy Neck is is in Barnstable, uh, and and uh, I think the edge of it goes to Yama, you know, over to Grace Beach. Mm -hmm. So that, I, I'm kind of surprised that's not within the area of jurisdiction that you're talking about planning or regulation. Well, again, I think there are numerous areas. I mean, that's one example of a, a local project, is the sandwich. I'm hearing two, two pieces there, but the sandwich, um, uh, beach and beach nourishment and jetty yes. extension project. Um, I happen to be a planner here who's been following that project for now 10 years, I think. Um, there are numerous projects like that where communities are looking to beach nourishment in association with dredging, or in this case, an, an, an engineering solution to a long-term problem um, that are not part of this of the state's planning area, um, and that I think may have been deliberate. I mean, this is uh, okay, but you, what you're saying is still part of our uh, our area of regulation right. and uh, concern. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, yes. Okay. We, we comment on those kinds of projects, and in that case, we it's a development region. Just to clarify, it's three tenths of a mile out from the mean high water mark. Exactly, okay. which is 1,500 feet. Yeah. Okay. okay, that's right. All right. Thank Sorry, you. I should have covered uh, that's okay. the jurisdictional area to begin with. Um, okay, so this is uh, habitat areas for the North Atlantic right whale. Um, again, by use, you know, sort of the darker colors meaning a higher intensity of use. Um, so then they utilized data like this um, with their science advisory um, work group and the sub work groups under that to identify the special sensitive and unique habitats. And you go from something like this to this, which, let's go back again, is clearly that interior dark red area. Um, but this is where the most sightings of the right whales have um, been made. Um, so this turns into a map that is used in a more regulatory fashion. I'll get into that in a second. Um, for clarity purposes, I'm calling them management maps. Um, here's another example. This is um, where shellfish and crustaceans are located. And the different colors represent different kinds of shellfish and crustaceans. Um, they use that in combination with um, fisheries resources, again, high, medium, low, um, to come up with what they're calling the important fish resource areas. And so you see those here in the hatching, um, mostly in the Nantucket Sound part of, uh, of Cape Cod. Um, so, Following all that data collection, they then went away and did a compatibility analysis where they looked at each of the uses allowed under the Ocean Sanctuaries Act and also um, by the Oceans Act of 2008. Um, they looked at those specific uses in relationship to each of these resources and uh, tried to determine compatibility between those allowed uses and those resources. And the result was um, a number of compatibility maps that are used in conjunction with siting and performance standards for each of those specific uses. And I'll give you some examples. Um, so this is kind of overwhelming at, at first glance. This is the management map for sand and gravel. Um, and what we're seeing here is um, those special sensitive and unique areas, those sort of core habitat areas for a variety of, of resources, variety of, of whales in here, terns in here, the shellfishes, again, you can see here, the, or the important fish resource areas is this area here, <coughs> as well as, um, here, here are the, the resources that are, um, the natural resources that they felt would be incompatible with sand and gravel mining, and then also some of the, the uses of human activities um, occurring in those areas um, that uh, might not be absolutely incompatible, but where there would be some, some incompatibilities. Um, 
and they identified recreational fishing and commercial fishing as, as being problems. So for each of the different allowed uses, standing rod mining is one, they went through and they did this kind of analysis and prepared this kind of a map. Uh, which is then used in conjunction with the siting standards. So if you want to s propose a sand and gravel project in the ocean waters, um, you need to essentially avoid areas that have been defined as exclusionary, really that a, a higher level where um, sand and gravel mining in whale habitat they've determined is an exclusionary activity. Um, you can overcome that presumption by demonstrating that uh, there's no less damaging practical alternative to your proposed use in that location, or to provide better data that the whales aren't really there, or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, or if you're proposing a use in one of those recreational activity areas or commercial fishing activities, those human use areas where uh, they've determined that there could be an incompatibility. Um, there's a lesser standard which is avoid, minimize, or mitigate the impacts. So that's the siting criteria. Once you've overcome the siting issues, um, then you need to go through the regular permitting process through NEPA and meet all of those permitting standards um, where the baseline test essentially is avoid, minimize, and mitigate your impacts. So this is the overall big picture map that um, <coughs> compiles all of the different management maps um, in, in sort of a simplified way. Um, the red area, which is coincident with the uh, Cape Cod Ocean Sanctuary, um, the plan identifies as n no activity area. Nothing is allowed there at all. Um, they have identified two areas um, off the Elizabeth Islands and off the no man's land as specifically um, wind energy or potentially uh, any kind of renewable energy um, development areas of a commercial scale. And they define commercial scale as greater than 10 turbines. Um, these areas they anticipate you know, could accommodate, I forget how many, I think they said 150 turbines um, based on the, you know, the layout of the Cape Wind project. Um, but it could also accommodate another kind of renewable energy project. The, the, the majority of the planning area is in this blue slash, and that has been defined as a multi-use area. And again, that's where any of the uses allowed under the Ocean Sanctuaries Act um, may be allowed subject to those siting and performance standards that I just went through for the specific use. Um, in the multi-use area, commercial scale wind is, is prohibited. That's laid out in the plan. Community scale wind, um, which they've defined as 10 turbines or less, could be allowed, provided also, these are some additional criteria, that the selecting of the affected communities, or the town of the affected communities, agree, um, and that an economic benefit to the community is demonstrated and then it also has to meet all of the siting and performance standards. Um, the plan, uh, yes? Yeah. How do they define affected community? They don't. Yeah. <coughs> That's to be determined. That's where we're going to be. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, this, the plan is very broad. It could probably be interpreted by any affected community. Mm -hmm. Is it economic benefit determined? It's not. Not defined. Not at present. So uh, what I'm reviewing is the draft plan, obviously. We have is this done by a plan someplace? So what the plan also suggests is that any turbine um, proposed within the um, planning area uh, should be subject to development of in regional impact review by the two regional agencies that have that review authority. Um, we don't presently have thresholds um, to ensure that we review, we review the turbines, but they lay that on the plan. It also says that there is um, a cap of 10 turbines in each RPA planning area um, based on some uh, discussions that have gone, gone on during the comment period that 
cap may increase uh, for King Cup. So here's the management map for community scale plan. And uh, the exclusionary areas for wind, those areas where it meets that, has to meet that higher um, threshold of review for siting a, a wind project, are most of the areas that are shown here. Um, this area, this brown hatch, is commercial fishing, I believe. So you see that here, you see that here. Um, also the, um, the navigational lanes, um, in the of blue and this green, um, those are defined as not exclusionary, but avoid these resources. So they have a, sort of a lesser standard of review uh, for siting purposes. Um, but you can see for Cape Cod, there are areas in the Sound and in the Bay where um, community scale wind, if it meets those other criteria, um, could be permitted. And it, of course, they could be proposed in the exclusionary areas. They just have to go through the process of addressing those other um, criteria. <coughs> so I'm nearly at the end here. Um, the plan. Uh, puts out a couple of charges to uh, regional planning agencies, as I've, as I've mentioned, um, that uh, Cape, the Cape Cod Commission, Martha, Martha's Vineyard Commission, should be able to review wind yeah. turbines in the, the ocean area. Um, in this um, intervening time since the, um, the comment period opened, we've also received a letter from the Executive Office of Environmental Affairs indicating that the RPA should also be allowed to determine the appropriate scale of renewable energy facilities. Um, and then the plan also acknowledges that districts of critical planning concern, DCPCs, are a tool that are available to the Marcus Vineyard and Cape Cod communities to help address planning and regulatory concerns um, in our ocean waters. So just as a summary, um, the state you know, took comments through, formal comments through November 23rd. Um, they're busy making their revisions and they have to complicate this plan by December 31st. And that's all I have unless you have any questions about the plan for me. Yes, Bill. Uh, <coughs> the Martha's Vineyard process doesn't require a review. Because I think what you're asking for us is to do a nomination of this as a DCPC? Well, that's what I'm proposing here. No, I'm asking yeah. Heather. Yeah. Uh, Paul is going to get into that? Yeah. yeah. So why don't we, Sorry, should yeah. we let Paul give his presentation? I'd like to my question. Oh, fine. Okay. Martha's Vineyard process doesn't require it to go to an assembly for, uh, say for approval for and support. Approval. But from Kate, any DCPC that's nominated here, let's go to the assembly, mm -hmm. I believe. Okay. The assembly doesn't meet after today. Right. And so I don't see how we'd be able to how we'd be able to accommodate this between now and the end of the year, especially with the questions that you know that are you know that seem to be undefined with regard to the information we receive from the state. Paul, do you want to answer that? Or do you want to address that? Yes, it, it has to do with the DCPC process, and Christy Centauri, our chief regulatory officer, is here to answer any of the specifics on it. But in, in general, once the nomination is made and it's been published, there is a moratorium put in place. Um, over the subject area. And what we're going to have, what's going to happen here is we're going to have a lapse between when this plan is going to issue and we could see potential applications coming in and the time that we need to have a community process to help us determine what the appropriate level, what appropriate scale for commercial development is. And also there's a second important feature here, which is the plan gives um, RPAs in conjunction with communities, so the Cape Cod Commission uh, jurisdiction of community wind projects, which will be, from the Cape's perspective, anywhere from 10 to 25 windmills that can be used uh, to support community. And so those are two important processes that if we allow this plan to issue on the 31st, and this is why the vineyard went forward, if we allow the plan to issue on the 31st and there's a gap, then uh, we're going to be potentially thrown in the, in the middle of this without any guidance at all to, to people that may want to come here and, and uh, develop alternative resources. So that's that's why the, the moratorium would be in place. The uh, 
assembly, we assume, would probably take this up in April? Yeah. Probably in April time. Well, they could I thought take it, was, it up in January. Well, they could take it up. I was under the understanding that um, there will be letters going out to the towns stating that um, asking for... Well, I think we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves because we jumped right into sort of the DCPC nomination. Okay. So, so All right. I want to make sure that we're methodical in the way that okay. we answer these questions. Just something you said, Paul, let me clarify. Community is 10 turbines or less. No. And commercial uh, is 10 or more? Uh, no, the, uh, the, the definition for commercial scale is more than 10. More than, greater than 10. Greater than 10. So community is 10. Or As it stands now, originally there was a floor for community wind that was 10 turbines uh, or less, or fewer. Um, but that has changed. Because there's been a discussion of all the regional uh, planning agencies that are coastal. And uh, there's a lot of uh, interest in community wind. And so they have uh, put forth a couple of different formulas that will produce, from the Cape's perspective, anywhere from 10 to 25 turbines that would be community wind projects that we could uh, meter up. And you know, we've had some discussions about the, the community wind is sort of the hull model, but hull happened prior to utility deregulation. They own transmission lines and get a better deal than, than we ever could at this point. So you would actually need more turbines to be as effective as the hull model. And we had some discussions with Maggie about whether 10 makes sense or not. Mm -hmm. Probably more. Okay, just to understand the scope of this area, um, you know, the, uh, the, the Cape itself is 400 square miles or so as far as the, uh, as far as the land area, and the area you're describing looks like about 1,000 square miles. Is that accurate? It's less than that. It's less than 1,000 square miles. 500 square miles, so about 900. 900. Yeah, it's just under. Oh, excuse me. <coughs> so this is, the, this is the jurisdictional area that's the um, that we've got to take a look at. So this is the, the area that we have to discuss. As a regional planning agency, we have to embark on a community process now where we take these two issues under, under examination. How are we going to define what is an appropriate scale for commercial uh, development in these areas? And two, how are we gonna, gonna uh, meter out these uh, community windows? Uh, and they're two important issues, and they pull on, on different strengths. But there's a lot of interest in the community wind from the communities. And, uh, so we want to get that piece of it uh, cleared up first, how we're going to deal with that process and what that, that's going to look like. A lot of interesting possibilities for producing renewables under the community wind provisions of the, of, uh, the plan. And there's also the commercial scale aspect of this. But to preface the whole discussion, I, want, I would like to look to Nantucket Sound and just say uh, that we are all aware that Cape Wind is out there as a project. And uh, the commission has never taken a substantive position on that project. We procedurally denied it uh, because they just they stopped coming to meetings at some point. Uh, so that's out there, and uh, that's subject to litigation. So we're severely constrained on the, as to what we can say about that. But the major uh, objection there is that no one should be able to come in and uh, go through a process. Uh, with less than good faith. It requires a good faith attempt at local permitting and you shouldn't be able to bootstrap yourself into the EFS. So that's a jurisdictional issue that's, that's out there that will be settled in the spring, and I'm thankful for that. But we have to look at um, the really positive things that have happened because of that project. And Senator O'Leary's Ocean Management Act and his Ocean Management Plan is one of them. The second one that uh, the, the chair and I have, have, have had the opportunity to attend a month ago was the federal process by the Minerals Management Service to look at this area three miles up to 200. In both instances, there's been an effort at consensus and defining how we're gonna do this and looking at local community benefit and, and treating uh, the areas affected with uh, a great deal of sensitivity in a way that will expedite these projects, not slow them down. And so that is very good news, I think, for everybody on the other side of this project. And that's what we're trying to do here. I think uh, within 180 days, we should be able to come up with the regulations that we need in order to feel confident about anybody who wants to come in, and it, whether it's a town that wants to avail itself of the community wind options, or whether it is a commercial provider that wants to look at commercial scale wind development. And I don't think that that's too long. And I think if we do this, and uh, we don't have to deal haphazard with projects that come in, 
We have a thorough process that involves the community. And the, from the commission's perspective, we've been through this process with the RTP, we've been through this process with the SEDS, and I think we can do it with WIND too. And we can generate in six months a process that has some consensus with it, where it's a known entity, it's predictable, it's a certain project, that will lead to the creation of renewable, sur uh, renewable power where appropriate much more quickly than anything else that, that, we can, that will avail itself now. If someone were to jump the gun and come in in January before we have this in place, I guarantee you it will slow the process down. So to give us six months to get this process in place, I think really uh, serves everybody's interest here. So what we're asking for, what, what is possible today, under the Act, Cape Cod Commission uh, and the County Commissioners can both designate regional uh, districts of critical point of concern. And so it's in front of you today for information purposes. Should you decide to nominate, you certainly have the authority to do that today. If you don't, the same presentation is going to the Cape Cod Commission tomorrow, where they will have the option to nominate on their own. And, yeah? Just a process question. Uh, ordinarily, this would go to the Cape Cod Commission first and come to us. It doesn't have it, I think no, 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 no. the designation of a nomination of district critical planning concern can come from any it, yeah, they come from the towns first, they come from the commissioners first. So so the next piece is that let's say that uh, we go through this. You have the assets and the resources in order to support this because you're talking about an area that's you know, considerably larger than the area that we, you know, we're addressing now as far as land issues. Uh, the when we get a DCPC nomination that's normally from a community, and the community has spent some energy and time discovering whether or not the assets in order to in order to move forward, there's a specific period of time, as I recall, that they have to develop the plan that you're talking about. Right. When does that clock start for this plan? <coughs> the nomination would start a full moratorium. We would notify the towns immediately. Uh, nothing in that moratorium should stop anything that's already going on. The ocean management plan didn't anticipate this going to have any interaction with fishing or anything else. And you can see by that plan, that was an exhaustive uh, process that the state went through, and one that really should be lauded. Uh, Darren Babrock, EDA, they worked very hard on this plan, uh, and they've been very commendable to us over the last few months in developing our role in this plan. So do we have, we have the, the, the jurisdiction is ours. These projects are going to come to us by the plan. It's not that we have a choice right now. Do I think we have the resources? Yeah, I do think we have the resources. We, are, we obviously handled uh, Cape when, when it came this year. Okay, there, there is a, another concern that I have is that uh, other projects, uh, Cape Wind, for example, had the support of the facility siting board, which was identified as, as being superior to the Cape Cod Commission yes. with regard to jurisdiction. Those now, jurisdictional issues have been worked out in detail in the plan. In the plan. In the plan. <coughs> Excuse me. If there's a work out in the plan, does this plan uh, have the authority you know, from the uh, administration? Is this signed off on by the governor? The plan is going to be signed off by Secretary Ian Bolts, Secretary of the EPA, with the governor's full approval and authority. Uh, so we're acting pursuant to that. Uh, I think pursuant a lot to that or before that? What's well, going to happen on the 31st, and we've had preliminary discussions. The EPA realizes, too, that there's a potential gap in this that could be very problematic from their perspective. I don't think that the, that the governor or the secretary is in a hurry to have a project try to wedge in between when the, the RPA is ready to deal with it and when the plan passes. That's not going to be good for them either. You know, I think uh, this is not an effort to uh, stop development out there. In fact, I think it is an effort to enhance the ability of somebody to come through a process that is predictable and certain and therefore fast. Mm -hmm. than anything that's that's available out there to them now. So that is is the effort uh, that's underway. So it's a, it, you know it's a it's a. I think there's a lot of good news here. I think this is the good news on the other side of Cape Wind. I think we have a, a very serious role in the process. It's been recognized by the administration, and will be recognized in the plan. And I think it's going to uh, push us as a community beyond Cape Wind. And so we, we are looking forward to that. Now, is there a lot of work to do in the next six months in order to get this done? Absolutely. There is a lot of work to do. But it's not like we haven't been thinking about these issues, and it's not like a lot of these issues haven't preliminarily been vetted 
through the ocean management uh, process, which is also acted on a very expedited time frame. Um, so it's, it's uh, I think we should be embracing as a community the opportunity to be heard uh, in, in waters, in the state waters that affect us directly. Well, in, in looking at uh, the letter from uh, Secretary Bowles to uh, Representative Madden and, o and Senator O'Leary, it, it seems as though, uh, you know, the they are definitely giving uh, this um, jurisdiction to the regional planning boards of the Cape, both the Vineyard and the Cape Cod Commission, and it almost sounds as though they're encouraging that something like this happens so that we can avoid, it, it's almost a gesture in, in the tool that's been put in there, the DCPC, is so that we can avoid having the backup in the in the log jam that has occurred with Cape Wind. Yeah, the video has already acted to use the DCPC process. Right. And the plan acknowledges the two the two uh, commissions, both the yes. Cape Commission and the yes. Northern yes. Commission. Power and references specifically the DCPC as a the planning tool, tool to bridge that uh, that time between when the plan issues and when we're ready to, to play a role in that process. Yeah, what you're really doing is using the DCPC as a tool to maintain local control so you don't give it up and, and for this interim period, if I understand this correctly. That's really what you're doing, is you're preserving kind of our say right now yeah, in, in, in any projects that are promulgated over the next six months. It is. I mean, the, the Secretary has been very uh, uh, gracious, um, and uh, you know we've worked hard to come to a, an understanding about how we're going to deal with this out there. This tool does preserve that jurisdiction, and but I think more importantly, it sets in place a process that will lead to regulations, as all DCPCs too, do. And those regulations will be an understanding of what an appropriate size commercial uh, scale project will be out there, and also how we're going to deal with the uh, community. Right, and also it's not just preserving our jurisdiction, but our jurisdiction as the Cape. So therefore the towns, uh, they're being protected by this so that nobody gets a, an idea that they can do something, everyone gets uh, crazy about it, now they find out that that's not an appropriate scale, I mean, it, it sort of sets the pace of what the expectation is out of those waters before people start going ahead and, and putting money down and, uh, and dreams. And as, as Heather pointed out, there are some areas down here in the Second Sound and sort of in, in pieces of the bay there are, yeah. that, you know, could attract some immediate... I have a question. I have a question. I'm more accustomed to DCPCs originating from towns yes. on the municipal side. If we were to vote today to initiate, well, what would be the and now we're going to nominate, nominate this area as a DCPC? How does the process work from there? Where does it go next? Well, the next thing that we would do is, and, uh, and Christy's here to, to, to take you through that step by step if you decide that you want to do that. Okay, um, so okay. but you want to finish. Yeah, that's uh, Yeah, but well, the, I mean, the, the, next, as... the next step, what I would answer, is to communicate directly with the towns. And we have an 800 piece mailing that is ready to go out on Friday. That will notify everybody where we're at. We're asking all the towns for any exemptions to the moratorium that they want included where they may have some interest out here, even though none of this area conflicts directly with uh, uh, municipal jurisdiction. You know, many municipalities do have projects and, and have interests out here that affect them directly. We want to make sure that, the, that they are in no way impaired by the DCPC. So we will be sending out that mailing and looking for that input. My next question is, if we were to nominate this today, uh, what would be the role of the Cape Cod Commission? Well, we're, we're going to handle uh, all that notification. We'll notify the commission tomorrow that's been a nomination, and so there'll be an application uh, discussion in front of the commission. But maybe this is a, unless Maggie had a question. <coughs> I just wanted to process. make, in terms of process, I appreciate it before that, the moratorium, is a moratorium on development of renewable energy projects, or is it a moratorium on everything in the DCPC area? It is a general moratorium on permitted act, on permitting any activities out there. So I think this is a. Well, my next po the question is: there are many dredging permits that are up for renewal, and um, I'll take my wind, my renewable energy hat up for my dredge hat. Yeah. Are you then? Will that then hold up the issuing of dredging permits that are scheduled 
for this winter season. But does it work? Yeah. Christy, why don't you take us through this? I can, I, can, I can help answer that question, I think. Um, I may punt it to you, but um, the initial moratorium is a full moratorium, uh, which will be in place until January 21st, when the nomination um, would go to the full commission for a vote um, to accept the nomination for consideration. And in that vote, we could outline specific activities um, that we hear back from all of the communities on that should be allowed to go forward during the remaining period of the DCP, PC if it's actually designated. Question. That would itemize all of those dredging permits. So, so we're talking about a limited area, a limited time for a full moratorium um, where right dredging permits might not be able to go forward. But again, it's an area that starts 1,500 feet from mean high water. And so I'm going, so and before I say that, I don't know that it's an issue, because the, our peak dredging season ends is January. Right. Because mm -hmm. we have the winter flounder that shuts us down in February. Right. So I, I know we're going for two weeks to going to Truro. I don't know, and I'd ask that we should just have this conversation and know were we going to shut down a project that's been scheduled? I, I, I just, that's easy to find out. I can put a quick right. phone call, but I think we should have that information. May we have um, Christy? Please. Sure. Um, and, and to answer that question, it, it may be that they already have a permit. Right. They, they Some, but usually no one needs to, no offense to towns, <laughs> we're waiting on permits because they're not that organized. So I just want to make sure that we, yeah. we know, you, know, you may decide to go ahead anyway, but I just want to make sure you know if you're impacting That's well, Those are going to be the projects that would be sent back to uh, the commission stating that this is already in the pipeline to be done. Those would receive exemptions. No, I think no, what I'm starting no, to understand. very specifically said that permits were in place, they would receive exemptions. Okay. The right? practice in the past of the Cape Cod Commission Bill, is that if, if, you you didn't, if you do not have something in process, you have to then apply to the Cape Cod Commission, and in past that is an expense that has to be borne by the applicant. Maybe like Christy, answer these questions. You please. Can just go, go yeah. back and step and start. If you do decide to nominate today, which the Cape Cod Commission Act allows you to do, it's under section N B, um, the county commissioners, if you nominate, this will um, be published in the Cape Cod Times as well as ten local papers that we received the nomination. And that will begin the full moratorium. And then the Cape Cod Commission would determine on January twenty first at a public hearing whether to accept the nomination for consideration. And if they do that, that will begin the limited moratorium. And so you're talking about the limited time period from sometime next week, or when it would be published, to January 21st. That would be a full moratorium. A simple phone call, and then you'd have the information. That's all. I'll, I'll make the call. I don't think so, but I just want to. Want to do that now? Sure. I, I'm pretty sure we're going to be in Toronto, and we'll be iced in for like January, like always. But right. I just want to double check. Probably it's probably January 18th. It's still not clear that you cannot. You said you have a limited exemption. It's still not clear to me in terms of not just permanent activities, but anticipated activities. You know, for example, when you went through the DCPC for uh, Craigville Beach, there were uh, there were uh, houses that were, or, or lots that were exempted, and then there was further application for, you know, for exemptions, and then there was a process of hardship uh, exclusions. And I, I know that if I were in, the, in a town, and I was anticipating looking at an investment of taxpayer money to support a, an anticipated dredging activity. I would not want to look forward to having to go to the Cape Cod Commission and pay extra money in order to do something that I anticipated because we have a moratorium that seems to be specifically pointed towards protecting our interest with regard to renewable energy. And I, and I, I want to say that any my support for this, if, if I decide to support it, has, has a lot to do with the protection of the interest of those communities that have dredging activities or are in a, are in a place where they need to dredge, that they would not have bear additional expense by having to circumvent the moratorium. Yeah, I would, uh, <clears throat> we don't anticipate that any projects would be directly affected. We anticipate that the limited moratorium that would allow, lift all of those, any restriction would be in place by uh, the 21st of January. 
if for some reason there were a project that got caught up in it, they certainly could come through with a hardship exemption. Those fees certainly could be waived to municipalities with dredge projects. There's nothing standing in the way of that. In fact, most of the hardship exemptions that we've seen that are related to VCPC that were private interests have had uh, fees waived or some measure of them waived over the last 12 months. Mark, did you have a question? No, I didn't. <coughs> I, mean, if, I think Christy should just go through a step-by-step timeline. Let's, step yeah, line let's do that for us, okay. if you would. Sure. Um, so starting from if you do decide to nominate today, this would um, go to the full commission on January 21st. There would be a public hearing, and they would decide whether or not to accept the nomination for consideration. That must be within 45 days of the actual nomination. So bringing it to January 1st um, would be at a, full, a regularly scheduled full commission meeting. Um, after that, there would be several public hearings held in many of the Cape Towns um, across the Cape. Um, within 60 days of the Commission accepting the nomination for consideration, the Commission would then render a decision as to whether they want to designate the area as a DCPC. Um, this can be extended up to 120 days, so if the public process needs additional time, there, we need additional public hearings, this could be extended. It just has to be um, by provided a written explanation from the Commission. Um, and in this decision, it will specify guidelines for development going forward. Um, and these are guidelines that would guide the implementing regulations that eventually would come out of the DCPC process. Um, the assembly would then get the recommendation from the commission, and the, just the assembly would hold a public hearing and determine, again, within 60 days, whether or not they want to propose the designation. Um, they can approve the designation by an ordinance or they can return it to the commission for restudy and redrafting. Uh, and then the designation would take effect upon um, the effective date of the ordinance. Uh, at that point, municipalities would have 12 months to provide implementing regulations to the commission uh, and eventually to the assembly for adoption. Any questions? Okay. Continue, please. Well, that, and I think that is pretty much where we're at. I mean, this is the presentation that we're going to make uh, tomorrow. I think uh, the nomination of DCPC is crucial. Yeah. I, I can't remember a time in the past where it would have been more appropriate uh, to do this so that we can get the planning. I'm confident the commission can conclude uh, our part of this uh, process in, in probably 180 days or six months. The towns, once it's designated, would have up to 12 months if they wanted to to uh, to weigh in on how they how they want to participate on this, um, but I think ultimately uh, designation of the DCPC, the development of a determination of what's appropriate, what that process for review is going to be for commercial wind, and the development of a process by which we're going to deal with community wind, um, are essential for us to move forward uh, with uh, alternative energy maximizing our potential uh, out there in a way that's responsible to the Cape, its community character, and its future economic development. And it, uh, this, is a, this is a great planning tool to use in order to get us there. And once we're there, it will be faster and more certain and more predictable for people that, that uh, want to uh, look at producing renewable energy and using the state waters off of Cape Cod, which comprise two thirds of the coast of Massachusetts. Um, this is the process that we want to do. We don't want to do this well, one at a time. We want to put that process in place up front so there are any questions. If I may just say, I did speak with, I'm sorry, I did speak with Senator Roller and I happened to speak with him over the weekend and we discussed this. And, uh, you know, he's definitely, he, you know, it was uh, very favorable to this and felt that it was deliberately put in the act as a tool to use, so therefore recognize it and, and make use of it. But Pat, you had a question. Yeah, which of the red lines actually show the area of the DCPC? It's everything within the red line. <coughs> the, outer, the outer red line. That's, that's there, but no, there's an inner red line inner. too. Oh. Uh, that is the 1500. The 1500. That's so you see, this is why I don't think a lot of trash projects are going to be affected. You know, you see that there's a significant area in mm -hmm. Pontsville Harbor and Lewis Bay and uh, Pleasant Bay. Right, and then there's uh, Truro up there, which I know is going to be the payment, payment, and yeah, payment. 
in, you know, we've got lots of power. Right, they're all the within their own municipal lines. Right. So it shouldn't be, um, it shouldn't be in it. Okay. Um, I did be Twain. Um, I, you know, in the moratorium, if I understood, understand correctly, for now January 21st should not impact the work that we have scheduled. We will, this is a question he asked, <laughs> he's asking me, um, Stage Harbor, which is in Chatham, is in the permitting process, and they are 2,500 feet out. So that one is... Um, Stage Harbor is, um, I'm not exactly sure what that is, but it's, yeah, it's in here, isn't it? But their project is, is 2,500 feet out. It's a long I mean, that looks like it's... What's the anticipated time frame for that? Uh, they're in the permitting. They're in the renewal process. So in the short run, the work that we've got scheduled is allegedly all permitted. Because um, and then Swan River, you should know, is working on a permit, but that's inside, so it shouldn't be an issue. Um, but the Stage Harbor one is... In the future. Right. Just to say, the only one we have, other ones we might want to do outreach to is in case the steamship authority has something. You know, well, the carry on. But isn't that part of the letter? This is part of the communication that you're sending out. Well, the only, yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's part of the notification, the 800, to get all of these responses back. And right. if the only projects that would be affected is those projects that have not been permitted but would be permitted within the next really three weeks mm -hmm. of January. Okay. and. Uh, then I think after that we're fine. Right, because so then that, the, the full moratorium is lifted. Yeah, the limited moratorium kicks in and all of these projects would be exempt from it. I think we're okay. Okay, thank you. So, yes? I've got to ask this question. If we do nothing, what happens? We run a risk. A risk? Yep. Okay, what is the risk? The risk is that you're going to have a project or a development take the, the plan and uh, try to seek to permit a project in there without us having uh, outlined how we're going to do that and how we're going to need it. And I think what you run the risk of is Cape Wind 2 from a procedural perspective. Uh, it will be much better for anyone who wants to do this to wait until we, we've got our ducks lined up on how we're going to deal with this issue. The, you get, the other thing you get is you might get a food fight in 15 towns for community win. Do you have any history of any application of people that have looked for permits in this area and within the last couple of years. Nobody's applied. So this is new. this is not anything you have any any procedure. Phil, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sort of get into hypothetical situations and make any conjecture about who's ready or who's not. No, no, but I but I do know that there are a lot of you have any if I could finish with yes. If, if, uh, what I do want to suggest is that there have been a lot of people and a lot of in development interest that have been waiting for this plan. <clears throat> and so I think that there is a risk. Obviously, the vineyard thought there was there was a risk, too. And if I felt there was no risk, but when I'm not up here, I think what you're suggesting is we're up here saying we should do this because, you know, we've got nothing else to do. We've got plenty of other things to do. If I didn't feel there was a risk, I would not be bringing this forward this time. I'm not suggesting at all that you have nothing else to do and you're looking for something to do. I never suggested that. However, whenever, you know, whenever I hear that, that we, you know, there's a project going on, that it's been, we have two weeks before the end of the year, you're asking us to make, you know, to make a uh, nomination for something, uh, it's the information that we've gotten from the state seems to be relatively inconclusive with regard to what they are committing to. They're making suggestions, they're making encouragements, it doesn't seem to be, you know, any guidance from the state with regard to the uh, length and breadth of the projects. Uh, so I, I just look, you know, I just think that in doing the due diligence with regard to this, that we have a responsibility to ask these may, questions. May I say something? Um, this is all new territory for everyone. That was evidence. That was uh, evidence in the MMS. They now have identified uh, uh, areas uh, on the continental shelf. They are looking for the local community input. That is a very good thing. Uh, they are trying to, I think the Cape Wind is something that has reverberated uh, throughout the renewable energy industry and through the government, and nobody wants to have this happen again. This is an area, every, as Paul said, people are waiting, and uh, there's a lot of money in green. 
and some of it's good money and some of it's going to be uh, charlatans coming in. If there is not, and then, then there will be towns that will think this is going to benefit us. They'll put a stake out there and find out this is not really the appropriate place for this because of your resources. It's better for everyone to know up front what is available to them as opposed to uh, putting out hopes and, uh, and money and then being told no and then having a fight over that. I think that this is our opportunity to, uh, to be good stewards and to make sure that the right thing is done with this land. And that's my position on this. I am in favor of it. And Pat, I think you had something to say. Well, I, um, I think um, I followed the process of the vineyard and their concerns with the ocean management plan and the fact that their coastline, they did not believe had sufficient protection as yet. And so they acted very quickly, I think. They mobilized themselves, the, the Martha's Vineyard Commission, and um, they had hearings, and the state people, I think, were there, Ian Bowles, I, I know, was involved. And so they came up with this DCPC because the whole impetus of it is local control. And I think if you look at the 15 towns on the Cape, that's their mantra, too, is local control. They want to preserve that. And if, if this ocean management plan at this point of uh, becoming law, doesn't provide those kinds of law control, then I think it's up that we have that same opportunity that the vineyard has, is to be able to fill that gap and, and, to, and to be able to work with the towns as, uh, as the commission can and, and preserve the local control, but also provide the technical planning support that the towns might mm -hmm. need. So I see this as a real benefit to the towns, and I would think that they would appreciate the fact that this effort is being taken really on their behalf as well. Absolutely. And, um, and, and I would think that they would accept it. And I was just going to say, you know, not to respond to them, but to point out, you know, that I think you mentioned that they haven't given you any guidance, and, and, and I would disagree with that. I'd say they're not going to tell you what to do, but the fact that in the Ocean Management Plan they've recognized the ability for the Cape Cod Commission and the Marcus Vineyard Commission to do these DCBs, that's... It, you know, that's an incredible thing for the state to do, and I believe that's probably encouraging you to take those steps, and, and they're acknowledging and making the claim that that's the right thing for you to do. And, and I, it is, I think, it, you know, maybe you're able to turn this fast process, but I think... It's, 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 I think sometimes, in some ways, it might slow some of the process down so you can have a chance to think and, and plan it out right so that people know what they're doing as opposed to having well, it mishmash going the, on out there. You know, the plan and the Secretary Governor anticipate the use of DCPCs. They've almost invited us to come in right. and participate in this way. Uh, the venue has already done it. Uh, I think in some ways it might be negligent to pass on the opportunity mm -hmm. to uh, maintain local control and to make sure that the towns have a voice at the table. And I really believe long term that uh, regardless of where you, you fall on wind power, the fastest way to do it is to engage the local communities. And to define a process by which that engagement is going to happen is the community that we, we have here. And I really feel that it would be, uh, it would put us at risk, um, and it would be to, to miss an opportunity uh, to provide some clarity, predictability, and some certainty and a voice and tail for the for renewable energy. Should the state allow their land uh, to be used for the private developer to come in? and build projects that would benefit the communities. And that's what it was all about. But in the end, what it was really about was the, the difference of the local control. And the people who spoke, including myself, um, at the end, when I saw that it was necessary because there were some groups there who really did not want to see any local control. Oh, yeah. They wanted to be able to deal directly with the state, and, and, and that's how they wanted it to be. Mm -hmm. And yet, those of us who, who work locally uh, really felt the necessity to stand up and defend the importance of the local control, that each community needs to have some say in, in their coastline, in their shoreline, or even public lands that are part of their communities. 
So I think that this, as, as Paul said, this is what this ECPC is about, is to preserve that local control. So I, I think it's important to do it. I'm on record, as you know, in voting for the procedural denial because I felt that, uh, that the facility signing board was usurping the authority that I felt should have been given to us. The other piece was, as far as my concern, is that uh, there should be some tangible benefit to the community because we are uh, suggesting that we're willing to give up what I would call it a, a, a tangible asset uh, to some of us, which would be the viewscape. And finally, uh, I believe that we there is a cautionary note that we have to be very concerned with. And it was in the New York Times uh, about uh, the amount of money and subsidies that, you know, that's involved in, in, say, in this process. And we have to be very, I think we have to be very clear that our interest in this is not is not driven by what I would call private developers' interest as much as it is for our concern to protect the interest of the constituents here. Absolutely. Solid. So if uh, and, and, and I hope you, you would accept the fact that uh, the questions I'm asking you are from a professional point of view, I'm not beating you up. You know, <laughs> no, I agree with everything that you said. Though. I mean, I, I really do. It's important. Uh, all of the issues that you raised are right on, and I know uh, where you were on, on the other review of the project. And those are the kind of questions we want to have asked and answered up front, so that we don't run into, uh, you know, when there's a lack of process in the use of public lands, you wind up with, in every instance, with incredibly polarized projects that can't seem to move forward because of that polarization. I think we have an opportunity here uh, to remove that from the scenario, to remove the emotion from the debate. Let's deal with the facts out there. And I know that we're going to produce more power from renewables offshore uh, on the other side of this planet. Right. Any other questions? Uh, just one final thing. Uh, when you're talking about renewables, remember that you, know, you have tidal power, you have a, it's an 11 foot drop between one end of the canal and the other and that there are other kinds of turbines besides ones that are run by, you know, by water. Perhaps, you know, that doesn't go safe and sound under the ground might be something to think about as you do Thank you. Well, on that, I'd like to uh, move that uh, we, the, the commissioners, nominate the Ocean Management Planning District as a district of critical planning concern and forward this nomination to the commission for consideration. I'll second. Um, in discussion, we're, are we saying that we are asking the commission to we are confirm? I think I think we have the right to do that on our own. Without asking the commission to but the, the motion I believe you made is for you for the board of county commissioners to nominate to, to nominate this, this, and then it will go. It will this presentation will go before the commission. Okay, but not for confirmation. Not for confirmation. Okay. The nomination. The nomination. I believe that's consistent with our policy. Yes. That's the only thing I want to make clear. Because I guard very jealously our authority in these matters. Right, as you well should. So all all in favor? Aye. 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 Great job. Great. No, it's, it's a great, and I think it's a. I think it's actually magnanimous of the state to give it that. So. Well, I think. Yes, this that letter.